Good afternoon and welcome to this month's show. I'm Luke McCormack. During today's show, we will discuss best practices with emergency communications and public safety strategies in the federal government. With me on today's show are Billy Bob Brown, Executive Assistant Director for Emergency Communications Division, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Wade Whitmer, Deputy Director, Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, National Continuity Programs, FEMA Resilience Office. Lori Flatery, Coordinator, National 911 Program, Department of Transportation, National Highway Traffic Safety Infra Administration. Nicholas Nyland, Director, Public Sector Product Management at Verizon. Mornay Erasmus, Director, Smart Spaces at Comscope. And Marcus Claycomb, National Business Development Manager, Public Sector Panasonic Mobility. Well, this is certainly a, uh, a, an, a very important subject to every individual and, uh, and very timely, right? Here we are in uh, the first month or month and a half of hurricane sickness. Uh, hurricane season. And quite frankly, uh, I think we all recognize that this technology is so important and minutes really matter. We've, we've discovered that. We've seen that over and over and over in a very complex environment now that we're in a full mobile type of capability. Billy Bob Brown, let's start with you. Uh, well, where, where, does, where does CISA fit into this? How does CISA fit into the whole emergency comms ecosystem? Uh, well, great. Uh, thank you. And I would like to start just uh, right off the bat, uh, thanking the uh, uh, Federal News Network uh, for your commitment to this important conversation on emergency communications and facilitating the uh, discussion. Uh, I hope that uh, this will lead your important listeners to continue to partner with us uh, to drive the improvement of uh, nationwide interoperability uh, for the safety of our citizens. Uh, we've all watched uh, most recently in Miami, the collapse of that apartment complex and the harrowing uh, uh, bravery of the first responders uh, working to save lives. And in emergency communications, we recognize that every second counts. Uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is, uh, has the vision to uh, improve security and resilience of the nation's critical infrastructure uh, through emergency communications. We recognize that improving nationwide interoperability uh, will dramatically reduce uh, national systemic risk across all of the 55 national critical functions. Right. And, uh, you know, I said minutes matter. You made a correction there. And I think you have uh, very astutely seconds matter in these situations, right? So important to make sure that we've got real time communications all the time inside a building, outside a building, et cetera. Wade Whitmer, uh, why don't you tell us uh, what is IPAWS, first of all, and then tell us uh, what's the state of the state of that whole program these days? Hey, thank you. Yeah, IPAWS. So the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System is, we like to use the tag term in it, that it is a national system for local alerting. Um, it is based on, uh, you know, the requirement that the president can get a warning to the nation that's been around uh, since at least 1934 with the Communications Act when they stood up the FCC, but has been uh, greatly expanded in the last 10 years into the integrated public alert and warning. So we've grown beyond your radio and television uh, to be able to push alerts into people's cell phones uh, and, and know whether radio directly from uh, emergency managers that are, and public safety officials that are able to send alerts through iPaws. And then uh, we're continuing to expand into internet devices and other display methods, any ways to get a uh, get emergency uh, information directly into the public. Um, this year, uh, or actually I should say last year, 2020, the pandemic year uh, has been a real uh, expansion. Uh, we almost got subsumed with uh, use of the system. Uh, it was unprecedented, almost three times more alerts were sent by local authorities and state authorities in 20 than in any previous year. And uh, we began receiving phone calls uh, very early on in March before most of the shutdowns happened for alerting authorities looking for advice and guidance to use it for the emergency that the uh, pandemic became. Mm. I think uh, with that comfort level that just continued to grow and we're continuing to see expanded usage for all sorts 
of alerts. And um, we have since uh, been able to leverage a uh, little bit of bad news that happened last year to receive some resources to stand up a 24 seven call center. So we are now uh, available around the clock to provide uh, guidance and assistance to public safety officials that are looking to most efficiently get emergency information to people when they need to. You know, it was interesting. There was this gap when people started to get these mobile technologies and can I get information on there? I know we'll talk about 911 in a minute. Uh, and now, you know, so often, I mean, certainly you're are pumping those messages out. It's not uncommon to be sitting in a room and all of a sudden, boom, four or five people will get this message at the same time. And you know, something's up. So uh, it, it seems to be working well. And I, I'm glad to see that there it's getting uh, much more use. Speaking of the 911 system, Lori, uh, boy, we started with 911 several years ago. I'm sure you'll tell us when it started. And it's, it's not the 911 it was 15 years ago. It's much more sophisticated, isn't it? it absolutely. Uh, first of all, Luke, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here uh, today. I really appreciate the opportunity. For those pleasure. that are familiar with the 911 program, uh, we have three jobs. We convene the, all of the 911 stakeholders of the public and private sector to bring them together to decide for themselves how to move forward on issues that are important to them. Uh, we collect and create resources for the folks at the state and local level that actually operate the nation's 911 system. And we uh, administer a grant program specifically for the upgrade of the technology of 911, which is really old. Uh, but we're, we're, we're showing signs of progress. I mean, to give you just a couple examples from this past year, you know, during the pandemic, uh, we did a lot of work to support the 911 centers. They, they didn't have a continuity of operations plan for infectious diseases. Uh, and so we pulled right. groups together. To, I mean, they're used to like outages and, you know, infrastructure kinds of outages, but they're not used to this kind of thing. So we pulled them together to to develop that kind of a plan, which ultimately was uh, translated into Spanish and, and shared among 30 or 35 countries in Central and South America. Um, the, the 91 centers also showed an, an enormous amount of ingenuity in uh, basically setting up ad hoc methods to divert low acuity calls for medical service because they were becoming inundated. And mm -hmm. sometimes they stood up these systems within, you know, one or two days. So they, they showed an enormous amount of innovation and, and ingenuity. On the broader scale, uh, the states uh, are really making progress in terms of Im improving and, and their infrastructure to a digital internet-based infrastructure, which will allow them to use multimedia images and it allows them to connect, um, which means that there's a level of resilience that just wasn't there in the old system. They're, they're making progress, not as quickly as we would like, uh, but they continue to make progress. And there are also states that are now in the process of figuring out how they're going to interconnect with their neighboring states. Uh, because ultimately what we want to end up with is an interconnected system of system. So there are pockets of that in at least half a dozen places in the United States. Uh, and so we're encouraged by that. There's a, there's a lot of progress that's going on. Glad to hear that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the program continues to grow and advance and align with the various technologies that are, are, are becoming available. Speaking of which, Nicholas, you can't make these things happen, the 911 program, the PAUSE program, et cetera, IPAUSE, uh, unless you have some connectivity in place real time, right? So uh, where does Verizon fit into the ecosystem of the emergency comm system? You said it exactly right, Luke, and I appreciate having the opportunity to be here and, uh, and you leading this conversation on such an important topic. Uh, Verizon has been committed to public safety communications since we became Verizon 21 years ago. And really our emphasis is on the reliability of the networks and the communication infrastructure so that those alerts can get to the end users uh, so that they that consumers, citizens can make calls to 911. Uh, and so that first responders have the most reliable network that they can rely on. And what we've seen over our 21 years is really first responders using Verizon, relying on Verizon and so now the majority of first responders use Verizon for their wireless services. And, and that's because of that reliability. And we talked a little bit about the pandemic over the course of the last year that we've all been dealing with. 
Uh, and during that time, uh, Verizon recently was awarded our 16th win in a row from Root Metrics for reliability and our 27th win in a row for JD Power for overall network reliability and network performance. So uh, in spite of the Im immense extra loads on the network and stress on the network, we continue to outperform. Uh, and that's something we're incredibly proud of. And over the course of the last year, it's not just about maintaining a reliable network, but it's also about restoring that network when necessary or supporting our first responders in relief efforts. We uh, had our Verizon response team out deployed at over 160 different uh, engagements over the course of the last year. And we've donated $55 million to first responders and frontline workers uh, and their missions over the course of the last year during the pandemic to help feed the frontline and, and numerous other programs. Something we're incredibly proud of, that, that ongoing support. We certainly appreciate it. And it's an interesting dynamic there when, when you get into these bad uh, states, wh wh whether it's a, a wildfire, a hurricane, a tornado, you know, people then are relying on these communications even more. And, okay. and you all have to, to make sure you're resilient enough to work your way through that. Morning, I know that Comscope, that's a big part of what you all do. Can you explain to the audience, what is Comscope? How do you fit into this picture? Luke, thank you for having us. Yes, Comscope is a global infrastructure provider. So we provide the wireline connectivity from copper, fiber, hybrid cables to all these service providers and network builders to also the wireless side of the business. We are the only global company with such a broad reach from the cell tower to indoor coverage, DAS systems, Wi-Fi systems. So anything wireless that's really at the edge to the back or capacity and, and helping our partners like AT&T on FirstNet, how they roll that out, Verizon with their one fiber, building up the robust backbone for all this new edge, edge devices to be connected. And we're very excited about also helping uh, these network providers with the 5G network as they build out these new capabilities on the newer, more densified network. How do we bring along um, emergency communications on that and extend coverage everywhere we, we need that to really help with that flexible, scalable and adaptable networks um, as we build that out for the future from outdoor to indoor coverage. Yeah, you know, that, 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 that stitching on the backbone is so important in, in, in all cases, whether it's an uh, emergency or a non-emergency, very important to have that connectivity in place. Marcus, we all think about Panasonic. We, we know the tough books. You can get up in the helicopter, throw it out, land, open it up, turn it on. It's going to work every time. Uh, but boy, Panasonic's way bigger than that when it comes to this subject. Uh, tell us how you all fit into the overall ecosystem and what you all are doing state of the state there at Panasonic. Absolutely. Good afternoon and, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm proud and honored to represent Panasonic and, and personally honored to, to be in this group of very important people today. Um, we are known, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary of the Tough Book line, and we are very well known for that. But Panasonic is really a solutions company. So it's not just the hardware, it's the solution sets that go with it. And as you mentioned, it is an ecosystem. Um, one of the ones I'd like to highlight to give you an example of that is the N1 Tactical. It is a computer. It is the size of a personal use cell phone. Mm. It happens to also be a phone and a camera and a scanner and some add-ons that you can add to it. And, and what we what we're moving towards and really the industry is, is creating smaller, faster, more multi-capable devices to let our first responders do their job more efficiently and more effectively. And when we partner that hardware with uh, reliable cell phone communications and a priority traffic for our first responders so that they are getting first bite at the Apple and the, commu the communications, that reliable communications, it allows for situational awareness and information transfer. And those are two incredibly important things when we talk about dynamic and pre-planned events. So this can be done in a pre-planned large scale uh, concert. And fortunately, as you mentioned earlier, um, hurricanes are kind of pre-planned so we can kind of prepare for those, but also dynamic events like the collapse in South Florida and like active threat events. And when you add into that a, a multi-agency and multi-discipline response the ability for those units to communicate real time and effectively is incredibly important and not always easy to do. So when you add software like ATAC or the Android Tactical Assault Kit that the military has been used to for some time, but is now available in the public sector, mm. we can not only have that communication and information, information transfer, but we can track assets and personnel and communicate over multi-agency, multi-discipline response real time, 
also feeding video from UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles and robots and, and feed video real time into command and control, which is vitally important when deploying assets to address those issues. In a real time fashion. Well, thank you very much. And we're honored to have you here. Lori, you touched on some various uh, activities that are going on. Can you mention, highlight one specific program you'd like to highlight uh, that you all perhaps have finished are in the process of, of implementing or um, uh, uh, got it in the hopper? Uh, I can think of a, of a couple projects that are really leaning forward in terms of the technology. Uh, we've developed a partnership with the Science and Technology Directorate at DHS along with Mr. Brown's uh, shop. Uh, one of the projects is to develop an interoperability testing model. So if we're going to end up with a, a system of systems, we need to make sure that the, the interconnections work the way we want them to. And so this model would set up an objective way to measure that function to make sure that it happens. They're also looking at using artificial intelligence in the 911 center. You know, as we continue to incorporate multimedia, for example, you know, if a, if a 911 center gets multiple videos, which one is the relevant one? How does that get incorporated into the 911 call taking and processing system without overloading the telecommunicators? So we're excited about those projects because we think they have great potential to sort of solve problems as, as the system evolves. Yeah. Um, uh really trying to stay in line with the technology and this interoperability capability is so important to do that. Morning, how about uh, Comscope? What's the, uh, give, us, give us a specific program that you all are working on uh, that's uh, bolstering up and enabling the, uh, this, this emerging com ecosystem. Yeah, I think there's really a host uh, coupling with commercial 5G rollout. How do we support uh, first nets extended coverage on that? Also Verizon, we talked about Verizon's uh, one fiber, how do we beef up the back wall? It's always amazing to me when people start talking about 5G and say, well, it's all gonna be wireless. Why do you need wires? Like you do understand there's no wireless without a wire somewhere. We need a lot more wires on the back end and how do we beef up that robustness? And then I think the merge and the convergence of uh, private networks. We're seeing a lot of private networks, especially for temporary uh, emergency coverage. So we, we're working on uh, rapid deployment units that's mobile that you can quickly move around telescopic pulse scale out and, and bring up a private network very very fast for those temporary networks type of solutions i think that that's something that's very exciting for us sure um uh very important too as we uh, stitch together the entire ecosystem billy bob how about over at CISA? tell us about a specific program you all are focusing on sure thanks and um you know, I just love the global nature of this, uh, this conversation, right? You know, because uh, all around the world, uh, and especially as we think about our own country, it really is about safety of the citizen and, uh, and our public safety and first responders, you know, getting to an incident, uh, having the command and control capabilities uh, interoperably across multiple, uh, multiple disciplines, multiple jurisdictions, uh, multiple agencies, you know, is critical uh, to ensuring the safety of those citizens. And what we've uh, been working with in partnership uh, with more than 65 public safety uh, communications uh, related associations across the nation in, uh, in our SAFECOM team is the advancement of, uh, of our understanding of interoperability. Uh, just most recently, we published uh, a new interoperability continuum uh, that SAFECOM developed that, uh, that recognizes in the all IP environment uh, the criticality of cybersecurity uh, to the technology lane. You want to explain SafeCom real quick, just so people understand what that is, how that, what, what is that apparatus? Sure, SafeCom is a, a, a public safety uh, uh, communications uh, related uh, program that, uh, that the department uh, stood up uh, several years ago. Uh, we've been working in partner, uh, partnership, uh, as I mentioned, with more than 65 uh, public safety associations. We have over 100 uh, participant uh, members that, uh, that join with us. Uh, regularly providing uh, voluntarily uh, their time to share best practices, uh, to share information, to work through uh, lessons learned and develop uh, tactics, uh, techniques, uh, develop tools that can be used uh, by public safety communications officials across the nation to improve and to drive 
uh, interoperability for uh, for emergency communications. Yeah, it's really a platform that pulls that all together. Appreciate that explanation for the audience there. All right, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. <laughs> 